Christian Living 101 presents a Bible class on the fundamental basics of victorious Christian living. Establish a strong foundation for conquering the trials and temptations of daily life. Increase your faith and learn to use the powerful weapons of spiritual warfare as you study with Pastor Gene Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be with you again with Christian Living 101 Bible Study. We're going to talk about a subject today that uh, many Christians wrestle with. They believe some doctrine that they've heard from others that say, you're never supposed to defend yourself. No matter what happens to you or your family, you're just supposed to let it go and let God take care of it. Is that really scriptural? Well, a lot of people have been taught that that's what you're supposed to do. That's probably one of the reasons that our country is in the condition it's in today. Because, you see, the Bible does not support that. Oh, you say, but pastor, you don't understand. We live in the New Testament age, and after all, Jesus changed everything. Well, he did, except he did not. One of the things that Jesus never changed was the Word of God. And so we're going to go into the Word of God and we're going to talk about the right to self-defense. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, and we'll read verse 18 as well. I'm going to lay a foundation for the study that we have today. And the first thing we have to do is to establish that the Word of God is the Word of God, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. And um, we need to understand that there's a difference between the laws that God made and the statutes and the directives that God gave to the children of Israel and those that the, the priests and the Pharisees have added to that down through the ages. And we're going to stick with what the Bible says. In fact, today I'm probably going to give to you more scripture than anything else. And so uh, it'll be some good reference material for you. And you can go back and study some very interesting uh, uh, Bible instructions that was given unto us, uh, both in the Old and the New Testament. Now, Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, he's saying, I didn't come to destroy it, I came to establish it and, and cause it to be fulfilled and certified as the commandments of Almighty God. Now, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in, that means the dot of an eye, shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Wow. Well, if we know the Bible at all, we know that it's not fulfilled until the last chapter of the Bible as revealed to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. A little short scripture, but it says a world of truth. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, Old Testament and before, today, the present, and tomorrow, or forever. And what does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is the same whether he's before the Bible, during the Old Testament, during present day, and during the future to come. He's the same. He does not change. And so, with those thoughts, let's look at the truth that the Bible gives us about preserving our material goods, yes, but more importantly, preserving our family and protecting them. We'll cover it all. Now, Exodus chapter 22, verse 1 through 4. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox, and four sheep for a sheep. Now verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. In other words, 
if you catch somebody coming into your home the middle of the night and uh, uh, you have to defend yourself, you don't know whether he's after material goods or he's there to uh, murder or kill or rape your wife or children, you don't know. Uh, you have a right to kill that person, and, and that's not murder, by the way. That's self-defense. Murder is when, without cause, you take it upon yourself to go out and take someone's life. This is an act of self-defense. You say, well, now, oh, wait a minute. What does it mean when it says, Turn the other cheek. Well, I'm not going to go there right now, but I'll tell you it does not mean that. And I will discuss that just a little bit later down the road in these studies. Anyway, we find verse 3 says, Now if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution if he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So now we find that if it's in the daytime, and uh, he gets caught, and uh, he's caught with the goods. Uh, then we find that uh, uh, he is to make restitution if he doesn't have anything. Uh, he is sold for his theft and works it off. Or in our day and time, I don't know whether it's scriptural or not, but he goes to jail. Anyway, I want you to look at a picture here. Uh, there's a big difference between defending our family and uh, being able to uh, protect ourselves and our goods. Jesus speaks of that in the New Testament as well. And uh, uh, there's a great difference between that uh, and uh, the fact that um, we just uh, want to cause a fight and get involved out of anger and we take somebody's life. That is not provided for in the scripture. And if it does happen, uh, we find then that the person that takes a life is to give his life, and uh, so he gets the death penalty. Uh, that's another reason why we don't have uh, near the uh, uh, respect for law and order today, I'm thinking, because after all, you know, uh, every life has got some good in it, but it's also got a lot of evil in it, and those who wish to practice evil have to pay the price for practicing their evil. Scriptural truth. Remember the word of God does not change. Verse 4. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. Now, you take back what's yours, and then he owes you twice what he took. That's what it's saying. Because he dared to invade the privacy and the possession that was yours, and now he has to pay double. Okay? That's the law of God. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 1, verse 1 uh, through 4. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month in the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male, by their poles. From twenty years old and upward, and all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, Every one head of the house of his fathers. Now, this is the children of Israel in the wilderness. Remember, it said that it happened on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. So here they are in the wilderness. And what's uh, uh, God preparing them to do? What's he instructing Moses to uh, take action about? He says, you take the sum of the congregation of Israel. You... You measure them, you number them, and you set them apart by tribe. And out of each tribe, what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to take uh, the number of their names, every male by their poles, and the, from 20 years old and upward. All that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. That's, that's verse 3, we just read that. 
And so the instruction here is to make preparation for self-defense and conquering the enemies of God. Now let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? Do you love the Lord? Do you believe that the Lord genuinely delivered you from the bondage of the law of sin and death? Are you convinced that the blood of Jesus really delivers you from your sin? And that you're sinless in the eyes of God because of the sacrifice of our Lord and coming King, Jesus the Christ? you believe that? Well, now, if you believe that, then you're part of the family of God. I think you would believe that, wouldn't you? And wouldn't you say to yourself that I'm a member of the household of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, who loved me enough to send redemption for me? I think you probably believe that. Well, now, if you believe that, now you're part of the house of God, are you not? Part of the house of Israel, are you not? Well, now, stop and think about it. Here they have left Egypt where they were enslaved. You get that picture? They were enslaved, and they had, for a few years, they lived a, a very happy and wonderful life. Uh, they worked hard, yes, but by the same token, they had liberties and freedoms and respect. And then there was a cruel Pharaoh that came and took over the land of Egypt, who was not an Egyptian. And he brought terrible penalties upon the house of Israel because of, he was from a people who hate him the house of Israel, and they hate God Almighty. They have no use for God Almighty because they are the outcasts that come either from Hagar and Ishmael or from Esau and Edom. And in either case, they hate the children of God, the house of Israel. And you need to understand when you like it or whether you don't like it. You become a target, a mark, uh, when you identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work for your life and the life of your family and loved ones, friends. And so you need, even as the old Israelites did while they were yet in the, in the wilderness before they got into the dangerous place where they were going to be confronted by the enemies of God. They prepared themselves to preserve their life and the life of their property and children and friends. Remember, they took a lot of people that were not Israelites. They were not of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They might have been of the lineage of Abraham, but not Isaac and Jacob. And remember, they took a lot of those people with them who had worked for them, who had been servants in their house, uh, who had cared for their children, uh, who had uh, uh, tilled their crops and harvested their crops and so forth. Uh, they, they were preparing to defend themselves. And so it says, and out of this group where you have the tribes separated, remember there were 12 tribes, and uh, you have them separated, there's to be a man, one of every tribe that is uh, uh, to be the head of the house, the head of the, of the uh, uh, militia, let's say, the head of the army that is set apart. However you want to describe it, doesn't matter. They were, they were preparing to defend themselves. And so with that, let's find some examples now of things that happened. So go with me now to another scripture found in Numbers uh, chapter 31 beginning with verse 1. We read these words. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, now who's speaking to Moses? The Lord. So the directives he's giving unto Moses is the word of God. It's directed by the Lord. Jesus the man? No. Jesus the word. Jesus that was with the Father when they created everything that is. You understand that? And so uh, we're talking about the Word of God here. And what does he say? Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. 
And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Wow. Oh. Well, I guess we need to go on a minute before we stop and make comment. Of every tribe a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel shall you send to the war. Now, that's 12,000 people. Yeah, 12,000 people. Now, what happens here? Well, the Lord gave direction for them to go into the land of the Midianites who had made war and gave them trouble to the house of Israel uh, from the time that they came near unto uh, their land after they left Egypt. And uh, uh, the Lord said to Moses, It's time to defend yourself. It's time to take authority into your hands and to glorify the power of Almighty God because I'm going to send you to war against the Midianites and, and you're going to win. Now, when we stop and think about that, really this takes place as the last great event before Moses was taken on to be with the Heavenly Father and uh, uh, Joshua took over the leadership of uh, the house of uh, Israel in the wilderness. And uh, it was a time when uh, God said to Moses, I'm going to let you see my victory over these that have tormented you and uh, invaded you and maligned and harmed you as you've made your travels and as you're approaching now to take over uh, the land that I promised unto you through your father Abraham. Now let's go uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, once again. It says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt uh, love them with all of your heart. Oh, oh, I misread that. Let's, let's look at it again. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt, uh, oh, you shall call them together for a time of reasoning and working things out together and maybe have a little bit of a social party while you're doing it and oh well that's not what it says either I guess we better get to really what it says hadn't we and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee thou shalt smite them utterly destroy them Thou shalt make no covenant with them, no time of sitting down reasoning together, nor show mercy unto them. Ooh. Oh, but pastor, our Lord and our God is so merciful and he's so long-suffering and he's so gracious and, and you know the New Testament changed all of that. No, it didn't. The New Testament didn't change any of that. It fulfilled filled and established that this was the true word of God according to the actions and the examples set for us by the Old Testament and it was given unto us to know that Almighty God is not going to let his people be abused and maligned and murdered and tortured and tormented and robbed and all the things that goes along uh, with the work of the enemy and the disastrous uh, and terrible uh, uh, persecution and, and mistreatment that comes our way by the satanic forces of hell. No. The Bible in the Old Testament is setting an example of where God's people stand. Now, no, the children of Israel as a body did not go uh, to war necessarily in the New Testament. But did they? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, and so what does he say? 
nor show mercy unto them. You see, this is the illustration of what's going to happen to the ungodly at the last day of the Lord. When the trumpet sounds and he comes back to take over this world, uh, he's going to bring a destruction upon all of those that have persecuted his people, that have martyred his people, that have tormented them and tortured them and shed their blood down through all the centuries. And oh, what a price they're going to pay. And he is here demonstrating unto us in the New Testament era what's going to happen to those who have dared to make war against God's people uh, and have uh, in some way or another harmed them, hurt them, uh, and destroyed them down through the many generations uh, until the final day of the Lord arrives. And so it's important for us to realize that these portions in the Old Testament establish the position that we are to take and that God will take. And we forget, we think, well, when Jesus comes back uh, that uh, uh, he's going to do it all by himself. But when you read the Bible carefully in both Daniel and Revelation and other portions of the prophets, uh, you discover that when Jesus comes back, yes, he comes back, and, and he's the all-powerful one, but he also brings with him the saints of God that will fight the battle with him, and uh, actually, uh, they will be absolutely, we will be, let's put it this way, we will be absolutely indestructible because we will have the incorruptible, indestructible body that the Lord will give us for the ages of eternity, and the enemy won't have a chance against God's people and against God's kingdom and against our King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the great army that he brings with him from heaven unto the earth, and the great army that he has here upon the earth that will be instantly transformed, according to the book of First Thessalonians, as I recall, and, uh, and so this all ties together. Jesus didn't come to end the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. He didn't come to set it up on a shelf somewhere and forget it. Jesus came to fulfill it. Remember that's the first couple of scriptures we read? Well, now let's go on and let's see what happens in the Old Testament. Uh, let's look at David. Now David is the epitome of of God's kingdom. God's love for David represents the love of Jesus for his people today. And God said that David was a man after his own heart. Well, you and I need to be after God's own heart today too, don't we? And in order to do that, are we going to be perfect? Not in ourselves, that's for sure. We all make mistakes and we fall short. God has taken us unto himself. He has chosen us to be his people. He responds unto us as being his people. And yes, we're going to have to pay for our sin if we continue to sin. After we've uh, come unto the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to reap what we sow here on this earth. You just can't get away from it. Sometimes God might intervene and, and ease the pain of what you've sown. But uh, in many instances, the deeds that we do today will pay for tomorrow, whether they be good or whether they be bad. But in eternity, they will not be held against us because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we repent and we return away from the way of sin and disobedience and rebellion or even just indifference and ignorance and get back into the kingdom uh, of God, uh, uh, turning away from those things that have robbed us of fellowship with our Lord, uh, we're going to be okay. But we can lose out if we choose to say, oh, I'm not going to serve God anymore. You know, I served God when I was a boy, and I served God when I was a young man, and I tried to raise my family according to the ways of the Lord, and, and you know, this went wrong, and that went wrong. 
course, you forget to tell what you didn't do. You forget to tell what you did do that you shouldn't have done. And you forget to deal with the fact that somewhere along the line, uh, you lost your fellowship with the Lord because of the cares of this world. And therefore, you all these things came your way. Now, they could have turned you to the Lord, or you can harden your heart. And you can rebel against God and say, God, it's your fault. Remember we talked about that last week or the week before? How uh, Adam looked at the God and said, God, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have been in this situation. It's that woman you gave to me. He wanted to blame somebody else. Well, you know, same thing goes on today. And whether we like to admit it or not, it's easy for us to find an excuse or reason and uh, to blame some other event or situation or person or uh, whatever it may be that came our way that we didn't like and it's all their fault because we did No, no. It's not their fault. It's your fault. It's my fault. We have the ability, once we come into the kingdom of God, and I've said this many times, we have the ability for the first time in our life to say unto sin, no. I don't need you. I don't want you. I'll have no part of you. Now you get out of here and leave me alone. I'm not going to yield to your temptation and to your lying deceptions. I'm not going to do it. So get away from me. We have that power. But how often do we exercise it? I hope you exercise it every time you need to. But so often we don't exercise it and we let the enemy hang around and and he gives to us all kinds of reasons and beautiful temptations and oh how good this is going to taste and how good time you're going to have and how much money you're going to make and how wonderful you're going to be and, and how popular you're going to be in the eyes of the world and all of this stuff which is nothing but a, a deception and a lie that comes from the pits of hell through Satan himself. So we come to David, First Samuel Chapter 17, verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail, because of him thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine between David and King Saul. And here's all the armies of Israel now. Get the picture. All the armies of Israel standing on one hill, little stream down at the bottom. On the other hill is a huge, huge army of the Philistines. And as was the custom in that day, uh, when that kind of a battle would come together, uh, rather than uh, uh, go into a lot of bloodshed on either side, uh, it was the worldly custom, not God's custom, the worldly custom, uh, for them to pick out their greatest uh, warrior and the other side pick out their greatest warrior and whichever one of them lived, uh, that was who the other ones fell in uh, to surrender to, supposedly. Of course, that never really happened, but uh, it was supposed to. And so what did happen? Well, let's go on. Uh, David said, don't worry about it, Saul. I'll take care of it. Uh, Saul, you remember, gave him his armor and with him wished him good luck and God's blessing upon him and all that. David puts it on and here's this little whip of a boy, a uh, young teenager, and there he stands and, and here's this huge uh, set of armor that he can't even move in uh, because it doesn't fit him and it's too heavy. And He says, I, I can't use this. You, you, you're trying my hands. You just let me do what I do. Well, what do you do? Well, I slew a bear with my bare hands, slew a lion with my bare hands, and, uh, and that's what I do. And I'll take care of this Philistine for you. Oh, okay. So then we go to the 42nd verse of 17, 1 Samuel, and it says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He didn't respect him, in other words. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Now everybody says, well, how do we know that Jesus was white? Because he is the seed of David. He's the seed of Isaac and Jacob, 
who are the seed of Abraham, who was the seed of Adam, going back to the beginning of the creation of Adam and Eve. And so, here it describes him. He was a youth. He was ruddy. That means he had a, a pinkish complexion and of a fair countenance. And a fair countenance is where you see light shining through from within and it lights up the face and the eyes and expression is there. And it has the capacity to blush and it has the capacity to uh, let the blood flow from the face and turn pale. Uh, actually, when you look at all the other peoples of the earth, they can't blush. Uh, there's no way they can blush. Uh, you can look at them and you can read, uh, maybe you can read their eyes. Sometimes there's no light in their eyes even. And uh, uh, they're, they're just different. Well, you say, no, we're all the same. We're all the same. Bible says we're all the same. Uh, would you show that to me in the Bible? I'd like to find it. I, I've looked and looked and looked. And all I can find is that the children of Israel are different than any other peoples on the face of the earth. I don't know what you're going to do with that doctrine that you've bought into, that we're all the same. We're not all the same. You need to understand we are different, and we are special, and we are the anointed of Almighty God, and we are the apple of God's eye, and He has chosen us to be His own perfect, private people. No, we're not perfect, but we are through the blood of Jesus. And so on we go. Well, now let's read 1 Samuel chapter 17 and uh, start with verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Or Ekron, I don't know how you say it. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to she Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. In other words, all along the way as the Philistines, this great army, fled from the army of Israel. They were slaughtered and wounded and left by the wayside, unable to continue, and many of them were killed. And uh, you say, well, how did that come about? Well, I didn't put it all down here, but uh, this is where, you remember, David went down, Goliath came roaring at him, and he hadn't even lifted his sword out of his, out of his sheath yet. And here he comes, he's so angry at this guy, he's just going to pick him up and rip him apart, a limb from limb, and, and, and tear him in two. And, but what happened? You remember David took the sling and he began to whirl it with the stone in it, and he whirled it, and he whirled it, and he whirled it, just at the right time as he's whirling it, he says, And the stone hit Goliath between the top of his helmet and his face plate in the forehead and knocked him out and down he went. Now that wasn't the whole story, you remember. If you want to read the whole thing, you'll find out that David didn't stop there. Uh, there's a lesson for us to learn here in the story. A lot of times we knock the devil out, we knock him down, we get him out of our pathway for a little while. We don't finish the job. David said, I'm going to finish this guy off. I'm going to take care of this once and for all. So what did he do? He runs up the hill. He jumps on the chest of Goliath who is laying there on the ground, knocked out cold. He takes the, the sword, which was a very large, heavy sword, and he raises it above his head with all of his might, and <whistles> off comes the head of Goliath and tumbles down into the brook. Hmm. And what happened? The Philistines, as an army, were struck with fear, and they ran. And that's where the 52nd and 53rd verse of 1 Samuel 17 takes place. Now, let's go on. Verse 53 says, And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. Now, that word spoiled means 
They went in and they took all of their possession. They took their food supply. They took their money. They took their uh, military supplies. <clears throat> uh, they took everything they had. Some had brought jewels along. Probably some had even brought some family along. Who knows? But anyway, they spoiled, they ravished, they uh, took everything that they had. And uh, I'm not uh, sure, but I imagine they probably took the tents too. They didn't, they could have. And so we go on then, and we find that uh, that took care of the Philistines at that particular point. So let's go to First Samuel, uh, chapter 30, verse 1. And David is still in the picture here. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives and there were therein they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. In other words, they didn't kill anybody in the city of Ziglag. They just took all their women and children because all their men were on the way out to war. Remember? Okay. And so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Hmm. Well, that's not the end of the story. Let's go on to chapter 30 in 1 Samuel, verse 8 and 9. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now those of you who wonder, do I have the right to protect my family if I have to use force to do so? Here is a perfect illustration of what is to be done. Now they didn't kill anybody. You want to catch that. Oh, well, we know that if they kill someone, we have a right to kill them. But that wasn't the case, was it? They didn't kill anybody. They just took them as slaves and carried them away and all their possessions. And so we go then and skip some verses to uh, chapter 30 and verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Why? Because God said, and I want you to know when God says, that God performs. And God said, David, go get your stuff. Go get your people. Go get your sons and daughters and wives. Go get your possessions. Take everything back that they took. Okay. He did. And you know what happened? Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 through 8. Again, it's David on the scene. And after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took... Methagama out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with the line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. And David smote Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots, seven hundred horsemen, twenty thousand footmen, and David hewed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. In other words, David slew the horses as well as the army. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to secure, or help, that word means in our English today, Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. 
Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David, and brought gifts, and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer, and brought them to Jerusalem. We also find that David got victory, and had victory, and uh, uh, took everything that uh, was loot and, and worth anything uh, back to Jerusalem. Now let's take a quick look at uh, uh, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, who was one of the three mighty men. Uh, he was with David at Pass Daman, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle. There was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from before the Philistines. Now that is uh, in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 11, uh, verse 11 through 14. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. Now here again you can easily say, well now we've heard what you said about uh, self-defense, but uh, here that was talking about war. Well this is sort of talking about war too, but we find that here's God's people trapped in an open field of wheat and, and Philistines all around about them and uh, uh, God gives them the power and the ability to defend themselves. And you see, you and I need to know that in our own strength we can't accomplish anything anyway. And so when we take God as a partner, and when we move in the legitimate rights that God has given us, God always sustains and keeps and preserves. And yes, we have the right of self-defense. Now, we had the right to go after our families. We had the right to descend, defend ourselves when encircled by the enemy. And now we find uh, uh, Samson. Samson is in a situation, uh, Judges chapter 15, verse 14 through 17 says, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. Now this is, you remember, when uh, they bound him, and they were going to turn him over to the Philistines, and the Philistines came to get him because... Uh, they hadn't been able to conquer him any, uh, before. Well, now uh, it says uh, uh, the cords loosed off his hands like, like burned flax. And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an axe, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramah Lehi. Again, God gives us the right to defend ourselves when attacked, when threatened, when the powers come against us. Now let's uh, again look at uh, the uh, Gideon, found in Judges chapter 7, verse uh, 20 through uh, 25. I'm not going to read it all, don't have time. And 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, and even throughout all the host, the, the, and the host fled to Bethshida, uh, Zerath, and to the border of Abel Mahola, unto Taboth. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. What happened? Let's skip to verse 25. And they took the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb and Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Why did they do that? To show Gideon that it had been accomplished. Now, I want to take you uh, just one more in uh, Judges. Chapter 12, uh, verse 1 through 5. Jepheth Ephraim. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Japheth, 
Wherefore passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didn't call us to go with you? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Oh, now they're upset because they got left out of the battle. And so we go on, and it says uh, in verse 2, uh, Jephthah saith unto them, I and my people were in great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, you delivered me not out of, my, uh, out of their heads. And so uh, Jephthah says to him, Hey, uh, look who's talking. You said uh, uh, you wanted to be part of the battle. Well, I can't depend upon you. When I needed you and I called for your help, you ignored me and you did nothing. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up uh, against me this day to fight against me? And then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manasites. Oh, so now we have inter battle because one well, had two faults. One, he didn't help his brother, his relative, let's put it that way. And the other, he was so jealous that he hated him and wanted to destroy him. Isn't that the way things go today? Now, one last word, which is the prophecy of the last days given in the book of Zechariah 9, chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. And this is telling us what God says through uh, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, they shall devour and subdue with slain stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign, ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty! Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. Wow. Interesting. Well, we have to stop there. Time is up. But I just want to sum it up by saying this. Uh, you can look all through the scripture and you can find from one end of the Old Testament to the other uh, illustration after illustration after illustration uh, where God sent his people into war. God sent his people to defend themselves. God told his people to uh, destroy the enemy. God gave his people the power and the authority to do mighty things with a few people, a few men. Uh, God was with those who trusted him, and God protected, preserved, and kept those uh, that went to war. And uh, you need to uh, understand and look here that no matter what the situation, no matter how you add it up and subtract from it, uh, the word of the Lord in the Old Testament is not done away. The way of the Lord in the New Testament is an illumination, a fulfillment of bringing to completion the power and the authority and the word that was given unto those in the Old Testament as an example and a tutoring tool for us in the New Testament. And yes, things may be a bit different in some ways in the New Testament, whether new or old. God gives us the right to defend ourselves against the enemy. And God honors those who put their faith in Him to perform that defense. And He will keep those and stand with those who defend themselves if they do it uprightly and justly in the eyes of God according to the rules and the statutes God set forth in the Old Testament for us too. You go into Revelation and you find all of the things discussed there that are revealed unto us in the Old Testament and in the last days God lets us know that there's going to be a time of great warfare and destruction once and for all that's going to do away with the enemy for good 
and we're going to forever be with Him. What a glorious and wonderful story. So yes, men, you have a right to defend yourself. You have a right to defend your property. You have a right to defend your household. You have a right to protect your family and your loved ones, and yes, your friends. And with that, it's time for us to say praise God for His wondrous works and take time now to serve communion. As I think of you dying on that lonely hill For sins that I am guilty of With every heartbeat I turn, Lord, to you I now know unconditional love I miss you, Savior, more and more every day As angels would kiss the sun above That sun above With every sunrise I am thanking you I remember your I think of the past And all the trials that I've had When your answer descended like a dove Lord, I thank you for your blessings And Jesus, I now know The meaning of unconditional love the greatest gift that God ever gave us was our Lord Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, who paid that terrible price as a sacrificial offering to cleanse us and to redeem us from the power of the law of sin and death and the grip that satanic evil forces had upon His people. And so now as we go to the book of Luke, chapter number uh, 22, We'll begin reading with verse number 14, speaking of Jesus as he comes into the room, and then we go on into the scripture that he gave us concerning communion. Verse 14 now in Luke 22. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I will say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And then likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And with that we get the words given unto us by the Lord himself 
as to what we are to do in remembering the terrible price that he paid for our redemption and our deliverance from the bondage of sin. And so, beloved, as we uh, think upon that, we know that it tells us in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians uh, uh, that we are uh, not to take of it unworthily, that we are to be sure that we are clean before the Lord as we take of it and have proper reverence and respect and the concern about what Jesus did for us. And so with that, I'm going to offer a prayer. I pray that if you've got anything in your life that's not as it should be, that you know the Lord does not find pleasure with, and uh, you need to ask forgiveness and cleansing and turn away from it before you take of communion. And so I'm going to pray a brief prayer, and then we'll receive communion, and you take care of your spiritual situation if you have one of need, right now as I pray along, you can pray yourself. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge the terrible suffering that he went through in his flesh and the whipping post, the crown of thorns and all of the things that happened on the way to Golgotha, up Golgotha's hill. And Lord, we acknowledge that he paid a terrible price for us, that our need and our life might be uh, livable on this earth while we're here. And Lord, we realize that out of that came the promise that by His stripes we are healed. And so cleanse us, O oh God, from any imperfection, any sin, anything that is not right before You. And Heavenly Father, uh, uh, reveal it to us and uh, help us to turn away from it and to have nothing more to do with it. True repentance. And Lord, we claim that in Jesus' name now as we take of the emblems of His broken body and his shed blood. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now take with me the bread, if you will. We acknowledge that it represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even as we have prayed, we ask God to bless this to its purpose in our life. And may it be a symbol of the healing power and the provisional promise of Jesus Christ our Lord as we eat it today. Take of it now in Jesus' name, and let's eat together. Praise the Lord. Now let us take of the cup, remembering that it represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the scripture that says, without the shedding of blood there's no remission. And Jesus paid the ultimate price and took our sin upon himself, that you and I might have life, eternally and be forever with him and so in the name of Jesus we receive this as a remembrance of what you did in our behalf praise his mighty name let us drink together you have been listening to Christian Living 101 with Pastor Gene Applegate this study is presented without church or organizational bias. We are totally supported by your prayers and generosity. Your comments and questions are welcome. Email us at gene at christianliving101.org or write to Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona 85050. That's gene at christianliving101.org or write us at Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona 85050.